All right, everyone. Good evening. Welcome. Hey, Larry, how are you? Oh, you get up and muted. Aloha, how are you? Hi, I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for being here. You know, for you, man, the world. <laughs> I appreciate that. That's very sweet. Or MD. No. Oh, thanks, Brian. Okay. All right. So uh, I, I'm sure people will be jumping in here. Um, do me a favor and uh, just keep yourself muted unless, uh, you know, I call on you. As always, you know, use the uh, raise hand function. If you can't find it on your computer, uh, by all means, uh just wave your hand and then I will, uh, I will call on you, uh, when, when we get to that. So just, we've got a packed meeting, uh, lots to cover, uh, tonight. And, um, and so without further ado, I guess we will get started. And what I'll do is I will start tonight with, um, with the dogs in parks, uh, conversation. So, uh, so last, uh, Dogs and Parks has been one of those things where uh, over many, many years, it always seems to come back to previous councils. Uh, it did come back to, to our council. The, uh, the Recreation and Parks Commission uh, did a, an actual, a, a really great study on it um, and uh, presentation. Um, they, they passed that unanimously and sent it to the council. We, we had discussions around it and ultimately we decided to try a trial. Uh, every other city up and down the coast, beach cities, uh, a lot of our surrounding cities allowed dogs in parks. We did not. Uh, and so, uh, we decided to take, uh, a shot at it and see how it would work, but we did it in a, uh, a smaller capacity and we, uh, our community services department presented um, parks and parkettes that they thought would, uh, would work. Um, and so we took, I would say, uh, a good portion of that list that they had presented and we, uh, we, we started this trial process. Uh, and I want to say it started back in October. Um, so with that said, there are a, a handful of parks and or parkettes where, uh, where dogs are currently allowed. Uh, there are rules, uh, as everything comes with rules, you know, dogs have to be on a leash. The leash can't be more than six feet long. You know, uh, dog owners have to pick up after their dogs. Um, they're only allowed in certain areas, especially in parkettes. Uh, you know, and there is signage that has gone up, uh, that, that explicitly states all this, but as always, um, with any, with anything, right? There are individuals who uh, ignore the rules. Uh, and so that creates issues, that creates problems. And uh, and so I've been hearing from a lot of residents, uh, especially at least here in District 3, related to specific parkettes and areas. And so I, I put out the survey, hopefully you've all taken the survey, uh, but uh, you know, my goal is to, to have it run live until we get uh, closer to the date in May when the council will reevaluate this. So I did ask that we bring it back uh, for reevaluation sooner than later. Uh, that way, when the year trial is up, you know, we can actually move either sooner or later towards uh, revising it, ending it, uh, extending it, whatever, whatever you know, it comes down to. But I want to have that conversation now. So. Uh, with that said, um, I'm going to just share with you guys, uh, I, I just purchased a, a SurveyMonkey account today so I could see all the responses. A free one, you can only see 40, and we're up to 600 and, um, 600 and like 30, I think. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, give me a second here. And let's... Take a look at the, let me know if you guys can see this. Can everybody see it? Yes. Okay. All right. So, uh, so this is the survey. It was, it was really quite simple. Uh, I, I've never built a survey before. And so I'll, I'll have to look into that because I'm now going to use this uh, as much as I can over the next year since I bought a subscription. But, um, 
but it was a pretty simple survey. Uh, I think it was five questions at the most. And, you know, the point being, you know, let's just try to see where everyone's at who uh, and, and what their awareness is of the program. So uh, on this first slide here, um, you'll see, you know, simple question. Are you aware that the city of Redondo Beach is currently allowing dogs on a leash in certain parks, parkettes for a trial period? Um, the, uh, the yeses, uh, said over 70% and the noes at 30. So that's great. Um, next question was, do you support dogs in parks to continue beyond the trial period? Uh, right now it looks like we have, uh, close to 60% saying yes, uh, around 16 or 17% saying no. And then, uh, and then the last three categories are, um, yes, but uh, only in parks, no parkettes. Um, no, create other separate uh, spaces, so other separate dog park type areas. Um, I wouldn't say to the same extent of the dog park at Dominguez Park, but maybe similar to like what Manhattan Beach has along Valley um, near their downtown area. Um, and, uh, and then other. And other, you know, is a, I can't show it here on, on the way I have the survey uh, being displayed right now, but other is, is pretty much um, uh, just people weighing in with, with other comments. Uh, the third question was, are you familiar with the current rules and regulations for the trial period? This one is almost split. So just over 50% of the people said yes, and just under 50% of the people said no. Now that, uh, you know, it may be interesting to do a follow-up survey to find out if the no people are now, are they aware uh, as a result of the survey and, you know, can they do a better job? Uh, and then uh, the next question was, are you aware that off-limit areas are generally inclusive of playgrounds, recurrent special event areas, sports fields, monuments, and park facilities? Um, so people said yes, uh, over 60%, no was just over 30, and then other, which is where people could make private comments. And the final question I had on this survey was, please sec select all the regulations you agree with. Um, and it seems that uh, most people uh, agree with the regulations that we have set up right now uh, as a part of this program. So that's, that's wonderful. Uh, dogs are supposed to be licensed. They're supposed to be on a leash under control of their handler. The handlers are supposed to clean up. Um, and then dogs are not permitted in certain areas and dog activity is recreational only not allowed for dog training or, uh, or anything of, of that like. So, uh, with that said, I will stop sharing the screen and we'll go back to Zoom here. All right. So, uh, you know, we're here to just have a, you know, a discussion and you guys can ask any questions and you can weigh in, of course. Uh, what I, what I ask though is, uh, is that if you have feelings one way or the other that you email me directly, that way I can put all that and send that to the city clerk uh, as a part of our May meeting and so that it's entered into the record. Uh, ultimately, you know, I'm going to take this survey and I'm going to submit that for the record as well so that my colleagues can uh, see it. But, you know, that's only one part of the story. And so hearing um, everybody's own input is, I think, just as important. So uh, with that said, if anybody wants to raise a hand and... Uh, say anything or ask questions, please feel free to do now. Uh, Larry, are you raising hands or are you clapping? I was trying to raise my hand. Okay, well, that, 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 that we'll, we'll go with that. We'll go to you and then we'll go to Ron. <laughs> so, sorry, is this for the whole city or just for our district? Well, we did it for the whole city. I mean, clearly, and I'm, I'm happy to take input on, on the whole city as well. Uh, you know, primarily some of the residents who have specific concerns about parkettes or areas in District 3, you know, uh, I'm going to voice their concerns when we have this meeting. But, uh, but yes, uh, you know, again, we don't just represent, I mean, we, we primarily represent the residents in our district, but we clearly represent the entire city. So I'm happy to take input uh, for anything. Okay, uh, Ron. 
Um, I sent you the text of the same question. Is the survey just limited to District 3 responses? Okay. Or is it citywide? And if it's citywide, what the percentage came from District 3? So I didn't, um, first time building a survey, I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't know how to set it up. I was doing it real quick because I was trying to get it into, um, I think, last month's uh, newsletter. Uh, I'm pretty sure there probably is a way to build a survey where you could, you know, collect that data and then have it, you know, fan out and, and, and keep all that type of information per person. But I, I, this, this survey is really simple and it does not collect that data. So everybody's anonymous. They can only do it once, uh, but I don't know who they are or where they're from. Uh, so, okay, Marianne. I was just wondering, because I see the parquets that um, people have children in there, and yeah. I'm wondering on their on your question about um, allowing dogs in the parquets, yeah. if any of those people are um, just have children and no dogs um, in the parquets. Th yeah, so would, I don't know. I'd be curious to know how parents with children feel about dogs in a parquet. Well, most of the, I mean, I can just say anecdotally from emails I'm getting and speaking with people that most of the parents uh, of children are, are not happy with it right now, you know, because the, there are, as always, like I alluded to earlier, there are dog owners who are not following the rules. So they're letting their dogs off leash. The dogs are running around. They're going near the play structures. Uh, they are urinating or defecating in areas they're not supposed to. The owners aren't picking, you know, they're creating uh, issues, right? And, and a park is technically for everybody's use, not just uh, one group or another. But uh, we kind of need everybody to, uh, to be following the rules so that it can be enjoyable for everyone. So right now, I would say the vast majority of emails I'm getting uh, from individuals are parents who are not happy with that uh, scenario. Does that answer your question? What about, what about liability, though? If a dog knocks a kid over, uh, that's a good the liability there because it's a public park. Yeah, that's a good question. I I'm not sure, uh, and that is something that we can discuss when it comes back to council. What is what is the city's liability versus the personal liability of the dog owner? Um, I don't know that. Okay, that was it. I just want to keep you thinking. Okay, good. Uh, I'm going to go to uh, Gigi and then uh, Larry. Hi, I'm um, sorry, I can't show my face. We're having dinner right now. That's okay. Um, I am a parent that I'm also, oh, I'm a minority because I not only am definitely afraid of dogs, I go to parks a lot with my child, mm -hmm. and I don't think I'm necessarily against, yes, you, Morgan, um, I'm not necessarily against um, dogs in the park, but I think as long as they follow the rules, it's six feet leash and whatnot and not pooping and peeing where kids are playing I think that's okay but that's not what I'm seeing I think we are at Sneary Parquet and yeah. the small parks like the small dogs like okay like maybe it can like six feet that's not a problem but these dogs are pretty big um, and you're seeing sort of where it is Gigi are you seeing dogs at Sneary because that's not even one of the yeah. allowable parquets yeah. okay oh, oh I know but yeah. the sign is there. My child even sees a sign, and she's three, and she says, there's no dogs allowed in here. And she says it really loud, and I'm so proud of her for that, but they don't do anything. <laughs> um, so I've seen big dogs. I've seen little dogs. I've seen dogs with no leash. I've seen all of it. Um, so I think people are just maybe not clear what the rules are, and then also not clear whether dogs are allowed at which part. Okay. I mean, and, and that, that is possible. I mean, clearly, uh, you know, myself and I'm sure the other members tried to get all that information out, uh, you know, via social media and our email blasts and whatnot. But, um, but uh, as always, right, it's easy for people to be confused about what, where is, where is it allowable and where is it not? Uh, so uh, I'm sorry. And we'll, uh, you know, we got to try to do better there. All right, Larry, go ahead. Um, you know, two things. So someone else brought this up, but like during the test time, can the signs come down uh, for dog owners that are out there doing this properly? And secondarily, when this is over, and is it, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down as far as permanent, is that just city council? Does that go to a book? The city, 
Yeah, that's just, it's it's an ordinance, right? Uh, you know, all we did was was modify an ordinance by allowing this. The, the previous ordinance did not allow uh, dogs in any parks. The the change to the ordinance just allowed them in the specific parks or parkettes that we had discussed. Uh, you know, when we when we did that, and so when it does come back for complete reevaluation, you know. Uh, the ordinance will just get revised again in some way, shape, or manner. Uh, I just don't know what that is yet. And that's a city council decision. That is a city council decision, correct. But not a vote of the public then? No. <laughs> okay, thank you. Absolutely. Anyone else? Thoughts, comments? Uh... Uh, well, I know you're not Kathy, but go ahead. <laughs> Just uh, unmute yourself. Yeah, Kathy's uh, hurt her knees, so she's in bed. Uh, so, uh, hang on just a second. Oh, absolutely. And Christian? Yes, go ahead, Jordan. One. Uh, just one thought. Um, I don't really have an opinion about the parks. I'm not in the parkettes enough to know what's, what the owners are doing. But what I'm seeing on next door is a movement to have parks on the sand, on the beach. And so then I think we really need to make sure this is not a slippery slope. And the next thing, we will approve dogs running around on the beach. Because there, we're barefoot, we're lying down on the sand, it's virtually impossible to get most dog poop cleaned up. You know, it's going to stay there. And there's a real concern about the kinds of parasites and worms that are in dog uh, poop and can actually penetrate the skin of people. So I think we just need to be, you know, looking forward and, and having that not be an idea that's going to be healthy for the community. Sure. And that's not something that the council is even discussing because we don't own our beaches. The beaches are owned by uh, Los Angeles County. So if anybody wanted uh, uh, like a certain section of the beach to even become like a dog run, they would have to um, petition the county to do that. And I don't think anybody wants uh, it just to be a free for all down on the beaches. So, all right, let's go back to, uh, to our fruit. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So, uh, we live right next door to uh, uh, Mc, McDeal JC yes. Parkette. And our experience has been, we lived here for 26 years. And people brought their dogs in the park when they weren't supposed to. And uh, we talked to them. And, and uh, generally they uh, were are pretty rude because they just want to do it. Well, now that dogs are allowed in the parkettes. Uh, I've probably seen in the last month, maybe two dogs on a leash. Uh, there was one time when we had a dog walker, a couple dog walkers, and there are 10, 10 dogs off leash running around in the park. Yeah. And uh, uh, I, you know, I, I echo the, uh, the concern about disease transmission because, uh, <clears throat> You know, we looked at CDC and uh, the, the EPA, and there's a lot of things that uh, uh, when when the dogs are defecating in the park, uh, you can clean most of it up, not all of it. But then we have little kids crawling around in the grass because we have very little green space in the city. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, you just think about your two or your three year old. I, uh, yeah, I guess it was Gigi, the other four year old or, or three year old. You wouldn't want your three year old crawling around in, 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 uh, you know, where the dogs have urinated or, or, I mean, it's, and there have been, there have been times when people just drop their dog off, close the gate, leave, come back 20 minutes later. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think that uh, uh, there's a lot of, bio, you know, uh, hazardous, environmental hazards having to do with uh, with this. Uh, then we have the older kids that are playing sports in there, and then we see them, you know, 
by getting the dog poop off their cleats. Yeah. Well, of course, they're tracking at other places, right? And uh, then I mentioned the dog walkers. And, it, and I mentioned, no, we have very little green space in, in the uh, city. And one thing I've noticed is that ever since this ordinance went into effect, we have less kids in the park. We have more dogs, less kids. Because I think, you know, uh, my kids are grown, so, uh, uh, but I think that a lot of the parents are concerned, and so we don't see a lot of kids in the park like we used to. Yeah. And that's kind of sad. Uh, well, I think, we're, you know, I'll just say, uh, you and Kathy wrote a, a really good detailed email, you know, that you sent me this morning, and, uh, uh -huh. you know, we're gonna, you know, I'll, like I said, I'll make sure that that's admitted into uh, the record, but I... I thought it was great. It was, and, and, and just so you know, you know, the next person who has their hand raised, Mark is your, is your neighbor on the other side of the park, uh, parquet. And, uh, pretty okay. much, you know, your street has been, uh, one of the most, uh, that's where the most emails are coming from. And so, uh, you know, I've made a commitment that, that, that parquet will not continue, uh, regardless of what the council, uh, decides, you know, I'll be pushing for that to come to an end. Okay. So, well, I appreciate that, and and I know that uh, you know, just asking someone to have it. I I saw a person out there with a dog on the leash, and I commented. I said it's really great to see that you have your dog on the leash. You're basically the only person I've ever seen, and and the person says, well, that's what the rule says. I want to follow the rule, and and I think it's some people think they're suggestions. Yeah, and that's. And that's 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 the thing, right? Yeah. Well, I'll, t I'll tell you, we wouldn't we wouldn't have speeding issues if uh, if people followed the suggestions of law enforcement <laughs> either. So. Well, I almost I I almost hit somebody uh, with my car because can you can, can driving down the hill and there was no stop sign there because he was going against one way traffic. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like. Uh, and I just think that 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 uh, it's just very concerning. And it, and and probably the final point is we're starting to smell uh, the uh, uric acid okay. from our house, and that's you know. And and if people were uh, more responsible, that probably wouldn't happen. Yeah. No, I agree with you. All right. Well, thank you. Let me let me go to Mark and, uh, like I said, who lives on the other side of that parquet. Go ahead, Mark. Hi, Christian. Hi. I'm here with my wife, Michelle. Hey, Michelle. And uh, just to reiterate with what Rick was saying, the majority of dog owners do not obey the laws. They're not keeping their dogs on the leash. Um, and uh, as Rick also said, many dog owners don't pick up after them, after their dogs. So, um, we'll see what happens. Yeah, and I would second what Rick was saying. The beginning of the pandemic, I would say this parquet had, in the morning, there was a group of nannies who came five days a week. There was another group who came in the afternoon, and they have not come for the last month or two. And I think it's just because the park's deteriorating. Mm -hmm. It's I've also noticed the smell. I think that um, my neighbors on the other side get it more because that's the way the wind blows. But yeah, I did walk out one morning, especially when we had that extra heat, and it was not a good smell when I opened my front door. And I, that is one of the concerns I have, that this summer is not going to be pleasant. I mean, half our windows face the parquet, more than half our windows face the parquet. Um, and I did also speak to the new park manager, who, by the way, is great, because mm -hmm. um, yeah, he's come he's out amazing. and trimmed the trees a couple times. And the last time I talked to him more recently... Um, he said he's been trimming the trees back because the grass is dying. And I'd say at this point, I kind of took a peek out there about a quarter of the grass. There's, there's a section about in the back. It's probably more about three quarters dirt, one quarter grass. I'd say about half of the rest of the park is about a 50-50. And, you know, part of it's, you know, even if the dog owner leaves a dog on the, you know, on the leash, you know, there are certain dogs that after they're done doing their business, you know, they that scratch, 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 and I've seen it, and I'm like, oh, you know, the grass just can't make it. Yeah. And with the drought coming, I mean, I'm sure last time there was a drought, the city had to cut back on watering. Yeah. 
And I think watering is why it hasn't stunk quite until recently. Okay. <laughs> is the only reason the grass is even alive. We also <laughs> have neighbors who have two young children and the, the father won't let their kids into the park anymore because of the current conditions that are going on there. Yeah. So it's, it's unfortunate that they're being deprived of something that our kids enjoyed when they grew up and other kids uh, yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, fair enough. Well, we I do appreciate your support on this park at yeah. it really just is not <laughs> the, the quality of life issues is being ruined by the people who don't follow the rules. Okay. And, you know, wh one thing I will bring up at the May meeting is, you know, uh, instead of waiting to the end of the trial period, you know, could McNeil, JC and, you know, a couple of the others where I've been contacted in mass by residents, you know, could we pull them off sooner? Uh, so that way, to your point, you know, summer is not, you know, totally lost uh, to the issue. So uh, that, that'll be something that I do bring up. Uh, and, and I will be submitting... I will be submitting all your emails uh, and your videos and your pictures and, and whatnot into the record as well. So okay. we appreciate yeah, we it. Appreciate Thank it. you, Chris. Of course. All right, Thank we're going to go uh, Marianne, Jeffrey, and then Larry. Um, I just have two comments because obviously I have dogs yeah. and they're big ones. Um, number, if you have a dog on a leash and you have dogs that are not on a leash, you're looking at some aggressive behavior. So I think that I, I'm no dog training expert, obviously, because my dogs are spoiled. But if you have dogs on a leash and dogs that are not on a leash, you're asking for trouble. And then the second thing, there is a product that you can use. I use it here and it's a concentrate and you attach it to your hose and it's, um, it's organic and it does get rid of um, the urine smell. And it does, because the other thing you're gonna have in the summer, if it gets hot, you're going to have a lot of flies. Um, so th that's something that if it continues in other areas with the dogs in the parks, then you're going to, um, the park division, I don't know if they want to do it. They're going to have to spray it every so often or it is going to stink. Okay, good. You know, Marianne, if you can uh, send me an email with that information, that'd be great uh, to, to also be able to bring up during the, the council conversation. I okay. appreciate that. Okay. All right, let's go uh, Jeffrey, Larry, and then Bob, and then Brian. Uh, going late, but uh, thanks for doing this, Christian. Uh, much appreciated. So I'm a dog owner, 65-pound lab. We always keep them on the leash in Redondo, always have bags that we clean up. So I very much am excited about opening up more open spaces for dogs and dog owners. Um, I personally don't use the parkettes. I find them too small for the dogs. Not a huge fan of the big sandy uh, fecal matter ridden dog park, you know, the big sandy one. Um, so we end up going to Hermosa more often than anything. Um, but I just want, you know, it's not just anti-dog voices. I want to be a pro-dog voice. I applaud the council looking at opening up parks, but I also hear the voices of people saying that they're not big fans of people that don't follow the rules. I too don't like people that don't follow the rules, uh, but I hate them. I hate that they would ruin it for all of us. That's all for me. No, thank you. I appreciate that. And I think, you know, you're always trying to strike a balance, right? And, uh, and one of our biggest issues here uh, is that we don't have... Um, we don't. We we have two code enforcement officers, right? And so th this could be uh, enforced by code enforcement and or you know by the PD. But you know clearly it falls really low on the ladder of of issues for the police department to be responding to, and people aren't calling the non emergency number in this scenario. Um, and and code enforcement we're we're limited, and so one of the conversations that the council really needs to have. And, uh, I'm, you know, we're going to have to really see where we're at, especially coming out of, you know, the COVID pandemic. And, you know, we it, it hit us hard, you know, to the tune of between nine and 13 million dollars in lost revenues last year. And so we really scaled down services. But I really think we're going to need to expand if if this is to continue in some capacity, at, uh, you know, at parks, say, or. Uh, or wherever, uh, it, it really is going to require a, a level of enforcement. And, and that's the only way I think we're going to get bad actors to, um, to change their behaviors and then make it okay for, you know, the good dog owners like yourself. So, uh, you know, there, there, there are a lot of aspects for us to consider in this conversation. So let's go to uh, Bob. 
Oh, wait, no, I said Larry. Let's go to Larry first, then we'll go to Bob. <laughs> wow, thanks, Christian. Now, I, you just answered my question. Is, um, whether it's human parents or dog parents, there's good and bad. Um, so for the, the dog owners that are not taking care of the dogs and not following the rules, you know, what's the options for enforcement, right? Because to the other gentleman's point, if there are dog owners that are following the rules, they're taking care of things, they're doing things correctly, why should they suffer because of people are being rude and not cognizant of the other people's concerns and just follow concerns, right? And so long-term, it would be nice to know what we can do as a city to enforce this. So if we can't enforce it, can we at least look at like other areas where we have centralized Maybe not all the park has, but there's like one or two centralized parks that we can take dogs in where enforcement can be controlled better with one or two areas instead of like a bunch of park heads. Yeah, and that that's actually, you bring up a good point because it's a question I'd want to hear from everybody, uh, you know, is, you know, a lot of people don't like the, the dog park. A lot of people do. Um uh, but, you know, is creating dog runs, you know, enclosed dog runs at some of the, the larger parks, you know, a, a potential solution. Now, granted, that comes with, you know, capital costs from the city's perspective, you know, uh, both from a, you know, building and maintenance perspective. But, you know, is that something that is is more of interest to people, say, versus, you know, just being able to walk your dog, like meandering on the concrete through a that's park. Not, um, that's not what I'm meaning. Okay. Polywog Park is an example. Mm -hmm. So Polywog Park allows pets throughout the whole thing. Okay. They're enforcing that large park with officers on a regular basis so that the bad actors that are not taking care of their animals and are not, like, keeping them on leash and not taking them back for them, are more subjected to enforcement on a regular basis. So okay. is there larger spaces within the city that we can use this as dog owners um, in a respective manner based upon, you know, the codes and have more enforceability? Okay. But well, yeah, now small runs, no, big spaces better. Got it. Okay. All right, let's go to Bob. Yeah, thanks, Christian. Um, I live across from the... Uh, park uh, on Flagler and Ripley, mm -hmm. and I didn't know that the dog rules were to keep them on the leash and whatever. I thought allowing dogs was like the dog park because the people I see play fetch in the parkette, and so the dogs are running back and forth. Um, I don't have any children. I don't have a dog currently, so I'm unaffected, but that's what they're doing in this parkette. They're playing fetch, and they're running around, so... That that's that's what's going on there. Yeah, and that that's the uh, that's just the open green space uh, right across the street from you, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. All right, good to know. Uh, Brian, I think you had um, your hand up. Just uh, throwing in the positive voice that um, you know uh, I live over here near Franklin Park, and I've really appreciated um, being able to walk my dog, a uh, small dog, responsible dog owner. Uh, but it's really been nice to be able to uh, go over there now and be able to walk through the park whatever hour of the day or night I want to and not feel like I'm going to get a ticket for it. And um, so it's, it, I really appreciate having the ability to do it. Uh, when I was walking through the park the other day with my uh, younger son, uh, who's 12 years old, uh, he noticed the signs and recognized the rules. So I think the signs are visible. I, I appreciate that they're there. I appreciate the, the rules um, that uh, have been outlined. It makes a lot of sense, keep them away from the play structures and stuff. Um, I haven't really seen a lot of uh, uh, disorderly contact, uh, conduct, but um, I, you know, maybe just because I didn't catch it at the right time or something, but I hope that it's up to all of us as, a, as citizens of our community that we end up being kind of the enforcers and somebody in this group said, you know, I go over and I talk to the people and I, you know, I, I tell them to, you know, remind them of the rules and stuff and whether or not they have a good reaction this day or not, hopefully it sinks in a little bit and maybe they don't need a ticket, maybe they just need a, a little gentle reminder. So I really hope that the program continues. I'm composing an email now to add to your uh, discussion group like you asked for, just so you have more to uh, to feed but 
I'm in support of keeping the program going. I, I don't see a, a problem with it yet. Um, I respect and appreciate the fact that where I host my birthday parties for my kids and the play equipment, that's a no-go zone. And I really try and make sure that um, I follow those rules and will try and remind other people to do the same. So oh, I just wanted to throw in an, another voice for, uh, I appreciate the program. I hope it, I hope it continues because I really, I really like having the ability to take my dog over there. Okay. That was it. Well, thanks, Brian. I appreciate you and Jory following the rules. But uh, And I do want to just let you know, though, that um, Franklin Park is one where I'm getting a lot of complaints from. Uh, so especially uh, especially the owners, uh, homeowners on Fisk who affront the park, uh, you know, and are sending me videos and, and pictures of of people violating the rules. So Have I been in any videos? What's that? Have I been? It did not. It, 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 okay, it, good. Yay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I, I would have called you. <laughs> All right, uh, let's go to Julie. Hi, I joined a few minutes late, but I I submitted the survey um, that I saw floating around Facebook a couple weeks ago, um, and I wanted to throw my two cents in. I'm a District 4 resident, mm -hmm. but we don't have a whole lot of parkettes hanging out here in District 4, so we right. very regularly go to Townsend Parkette. And while I haven't seen dogs off leash there, it's very common that people with smaller, medium sized dogs come and let their dogs piddle around in the grass for a couple minutes and pee on the tree that, the, that my kids like to run around. Yeah. And it's hard for me to say like, sorry kids, I, I don't want you near the tree because the dog just peed there and it's gross and dog pee just, it sits and it festers and it smells. Um, like someone had said that um, they worry about uh, the smell as we go back into a drought. And um, you'll see there's one there. Yeah. Say hi, Sharmar. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, so to me, that's frustrating. I wish, and like I said in the survey, I wish there was a way that we could have a no dog area in the, on the grass in parks where dogs are allowed. Yeah. So I know Franklin Park is a bigger park. Um, there's, I feel like there's a lot of space there where we could say there are no dogs allowed in this section. Mm -hmm. So people with small children can have the ability to have their kids not walk where there could still be bacteria from dogs and, and whatnot hanging out on the ground. And I, I guess I just kind of want to say that I, I really wish you could think like 10 years ago, Christian, when your kids were young, how you would feel going to the park, knowing that, that the dogs were there, because that's the stage I'm at. And yeah. then after me, there's going to still be, still be more people there. Yeah. Um, well, you know, so before you came on, right, we, we were talking about this and other people were expressing the same things. Townsend Park, Parkette is not even an allowable dog area. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, okay. You know, as I've said, you've got bad actors that are clearly going in there and, and allowing their dogs to be there. But to your point, um, each of the parks or parkettes that do allow um, dogs right now come with the, the list of rules. And, and each of them has a very specific area where dogs are only allowed, you know. Uh, so dogs are not allowed near the, uh, the, the areas that kids play in. Uh, that's, that's just one of the rules. Um, but, but, but kids play in the grass. I know, so I know. Yes, yeah. they play on the playground. Yeah. But kids also play on the grass. And people do games on the grass yeah. and bring balls and kick them back and forth. So while you're saying that they're not where the kids play, I no, they're not really strongly. No, I'm saying they're not supposed to be. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, but yeah. they could have been there earlier in the day. And sure. Then, and then kids come. Yeah. So I, I would... If the program, Emily, please, if the program continues, I, I, I request that there is a very explicit no dog grass area. Got it. In each park. Okay. Fair enough. And Julie, Julie, I, I think you have my email address, but, but feel free to also just send me an email with uh, some of that too, because then I will enter it into the record when we have the council okay. meeting in May. Can you pull my, my survey response? So I'm every, happy to throw you I, I, I'm going to submit, I'm going to, if that's in your survey response, I am going to submit all that as part of the record, but okay. it's all anonymous. So, um, okay. so I don't, you know, uh, I'll just have to I extract. I saved it so I can just copy and uh, resend it to you. Okay. 
All right. So I want to, uh, any, any other last thoughts here? I see it's 640 and I want to move on to the next topic because I, I have our final topic. Uh, th those individuals are showing up around 715. So any last comments before we move on or... All right, great. Then uh, the next topic, and I'm sorry I'm throwing so many different things into this meeting, but there's so much going on right now, um, uh, is uh, our, our local zoning. So uh, for the past few years, uh, we have had a, a general plan advisory committee uh, looking at redoing our general plan. And general plan basically is supposed to be done every 20 years. Um, and we are supposed to kind of think about where is the city going to be in another 20 or 30 years uh, and, and account for that, uh, you know, maybe look at some of the things we've done in the past. What do we need to change? Uh, and so uh, part of the process is, is having a housing element that's a required um, document that the state uh, needs from us. Uh, and so... Um, there are many things in this uh, in this topic that are outside of uh, our control. You know that that would be mandates from the state, the state trying to exert uh, themselves onto local zoning uh, through a variety of bills over the past few years, and bills that are uh, right now in play. Um, our council has been fighting back against that. Um, but one of the one of the bigger things that you may hear come up in in part of this discussion is the term RENA, uh, and that's R H N A. It's an acronym, and it stands for uh, the Regional Housing Needs Assessment. Um, and so, when uh, the state uh, H C D Department Housing and Community Development says, "Hey, we have a shortage of of homes uh, throughout the state." Uh, and they come up with a number, that number trickles down to the Southern California Association of Governments, uh, which kind of manages most of Southern California. Uh, and, uh, and then SCAG, which is what we call that organization, uh, comes up with uh, an assessment and a methodology uh, that then assigns a number to every city. Right, and that number is what you're supposed to have an allowable amount of zoning for. Um, now, we here have believed, uh, and they do it in cycles. It's like every eight years. In the last cycle, uh, our community development department and, and the council members really believed that we were given a, a very high number and a very unfair number. And I'll, I'll kind of get into that uh, in a second as to why. Um, and we have petitioned for that, you know, number to be lower. Um, and I think had the governor and, uh, you know, and the state not created a, a new, very large number that the state would need to comply with in the next cycle, maybe, just maybe, you know, we wouldn't be in the situation we're in right now. But the pickle we are in is that uh, our arena number has jumped up now to just under 2,500. Uh, and that, that means we are supposed to account for uh, 2,500 new units uh, throughout the city. Um, and that means we have to zone for that because our existing zoning uh, does not allow for that. Um, and so this is something that uh, the General Plan Advisory Committee, uh, it was thrown on them even after they had... Uh, kind of come up with a an idea for what they were going to recommend to the planning commission and the council um, and they had to readjust and uh, and try to figure out how would they accommodate all those units uh, the discussion is going to the planning commission tonight um, so um, when this meeting is over or if you want to jump off early you can always go and listen to that it's going to be far more in depth than we will get here um, and then it's going to come to the council starting next Tuesday. And uh, we have set aside uh, up to four meetings to discuss this because it's a big topic. Uh, and despite the fact that uh, we have been, you know, unified and, and really trying to fight against uh, everything that the, the state is throwing at us, um, at the end of the day, it's really a, an uphill battle uh, for us to overcome. And we will, in order to have a housing element that is, uh, that is verified and approved by the state, we will have to find a way to account for, uh, for these RENA numbers that have been uh, put upon us. We've already tried to appeal it. Our appeal was unsuccessful. 
Um, Councilwoman MD and I both went and, well, virtually spoke at, at the SCAG meeting. Um, and, uh, and so the reason I say that our numbers aren't fair, uh, and this is kind of a, you know, an interesting, maybe too much in the weeds, but, you know, Redondo Beach is, um, is pretty diverse in terms of zoning. Uh, and it has been for a long time. Uh, we have uh, R1 neighborhoods, we have multifamily neighborhoods, we have liveaboards, uh, you know, in the marina. Um, we have mixed use. Uh, you know, our zoning is diverse. And to be honest with you, compared to our neighbors uh, around us, in our surrounding cities, we actually have a higher ratio of multifamily housing to uh, single family housing here. Uh, Torrance is is the direct opposite, um, and they're a much bigger city uh, with with way more land than we are uh, than we have. So uh, so you know there has been an argument that uh, Councilwoman MD and I at least have presented when we've gone to speak about you know just equity uh, and the fact that you know Redondo Beach is not being treated in an equitable manner uh, by these um, uh, by these edicts from SCAG or HCD. So. Um, with that said, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to try sharing my screen again and I'll, I'll show you guys some information, but I, I, this, this is really more of a, an informative item. We can have definitely a brief discussion over it, but I want you all to be aware of what is going on right now. So that way, um, you can speak up whether it's at the planning commission tonight or at any of the future council meetings. I think it's super important for residents in North Redondo uh, to to weigh in because it is actually on this side of town where we do have a higher uh, amount of the population. You know, we have three districts squeezed into uh, an area and we have a, a, an enormous amount of multifamily housing. Um, and, you know, my meeting in October uh, where I was saying, how do we reimagine our neighborhoods and, you know, what can we think about doing here in North Redondo where we are more densely populated? to improve quality of life. You know, the reason why I'm bringing that up is because the zoning we have is, it, it's not going anywhere, especially with these, uh, these state laws that keep coming in. But, you know, we don't want it to get, you know, exceedingly worse. And we don't want it to get exceedingly worse at the expense of quality of life and the fact that we, we could use more parquets or more open space to uh, the point that somebody made in uh, in the last conversation. So, uh, you know, we could, it would be really nice to have uh, more uh, parkways and, uh, you know, easements in front of houses, you know, the way South Redondo does. It would be nice to have more tree-lined streets, um, you know, but how do we plan for and how do we do all that, you know, in light of uh, this conversation. And so one of the things I will say, and I will be speaking to, you know, in the conversation that the council has is an equitable distribution of this arena number between uh, the 90278 and the 90277. Um, and I, I, I think that is at least the fairest way to go, you know, to stick it all here in North Redondo does not make any sense. Um, uh, you know, I mean, I, I can understand how people can kind of look at a map and say, well, OK, this area is commercial and we could put an overlay for zoning there. Uh, that That's fine. But, you know, um, that's pretty much how North Redondo has been zoned for the past 40, 50 years. Uh, you know, and I don't think, uh, you know, some people will ask me and they will say, hey, you know, why are we zoned this way? And I, I can't really tell you aside from going back and looking historically at, you know, the documents. Uh, but at, at some point, you know, they upzoned North Redondo uh, to try to bring in more revenues. And they they created, uh, you know, my, my neighborhood went from being an R1 to an R1A. Uh, that just means that they're single family homes, but they're on split lots, you know. Uh, and some of these um, some of these potential bills right now in Sacramento are talking about splitting lots even further. So uh, it's it's starting to get a little bit ridiculous. And, you know, I'm, I'm fine with trying to be a part of the solution. But uh, but at a certain point, you know, um, even even that type of a uh, an attitude is is not uh, is being overlooked. 
and and I and I feel like Sacramento is trying to just run an end game around all of us. So uh, so anyways, let me I'll share my screen and we'll bring up uh, we'll bring up some documents here just so I can give you guys at least an idea of what's going on. Um, and I'm going to put all these documents into the chat as well, and then I'll, I'll, I'll upload them online. Uh, these are all accessible from the city website when you go to the general plan. Um, and so you can also get them there for those who are watching on either YouTube or, um, or uh, Facebook. Um, but these, uh, so we'll just start here. The... Um, the City of Redondo Beach Draft Land Use Plan and 2021-2029 Housing Element Update. These are frequently asked questions. Like I said, this information can kind of get in the weeds, but these are, this is something that we are required to do. We're going into the sixth cycle. Um, and so that period is from October of 2021 to October of 2029. Um, and, you know, it... Uh, the, these questions here are just frequently asked ones. Uh, again, like I said, I'll put it in the uh, chat box or you can get it online. Um, so here, why does Redondo Beach have to plan for more housing? Just to go along with what uh, I was just kind of briefly explaining. Uh, SCAG is saying that we have to accommodate in the Southern California region uh, 1.3 million new housing units in this next cycle between 2021 and 2029. Now here's the thing, when we zone for these houses, that doesn't mean they're necessarily gonna get built. It just means the zoning has to be there to accommodate it if possible. Um, and so it doesn't, one of the things that frustrates me about this, this process and the arena number is it's not helping us solve the affordable housing crisis. It's not, uh, helping us solve many of the systemic changes that, you know, are forcing people into poverty or, uh, forcing people into homelessness. So, um, it's, it's like an on paper solution in many ways, but regardless, we do have to comply uh, as one of the 191 cities. Um, now out of this, when SCAG is looking at this information, what you'll see here is uh, the RENA number that we are uh, anticipated, how we get up to the 2490, just shy of 2,500 units. Um, the units fall into different categories, right? Uh, and so you'll see very low, low, moderate, and above moderate. That's that's income, okay? We are supposed to be uh, zoning for 936 very low uh, income units, okay? And then, uh, as you'll see, that 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 changes for each of those numbers. This is also very challenging uh, to to accommodate. Most people want to build. Um, market rate housing, but there is a, a a huge need not just in Redondo Beach but everywhere for uh, for moderate low and very low. Um, so those are the breakdowns of the numbers there that get us to the twenty four ninety required number. Um, how is the city's RENA number determined? Uh, again, there's a methodology, and it's kind of a black box when we talk about this methodology uh, that SCAG has come up with. The city has been uh, forcefully trying to get them to um, change their methodology uh, and to... Um, and to be more transparent about how they come about it. Uh, because cities like Redondo Beach, as I said, we feel like we've been getting the short end of the stick for, for quite some time here. Um, we do need uh, to meet this obligation and to have a housing element because if we do not, we can uh, begin to realize penalties, uh, financial penalties, and uh, not only financial penalties, but the possibility of uh, of Sacramento also uh, preventing us from from issuing permits and uh, and and allowing people to do things that they want to do with their properties. So uh, it gets complicated, but uh, that's that is part of I guess the carrot and stick approach that they are taking with us. Um, this uh, number eight just uh, talks about the fact that we did appeal uh, and uh, and that was unsuccessful. And uh, 
Can sites that remain undeveloped from the existing housing element be reused in the site's inventory for the 2021-2029 housing element? Yes, but uh, as it says here, the new state housing laws are making this more difficult. So all these changes that continue to come in from Sacramento uh, are continuing to not only tie our hands, but I mean, they're putting us almost in a full body bind at a certain point. And so there are, you know, some discussions about, you know, putting a measure on, a, you know, a statewide election to force the state to allow cities to have direct control over their local zoning and remove the state equation from that. That's something that uh, I know Mayor Brand has been talking about, and we, uh, I think, as a city, have also supported that. Um, so let me just, uh, let's just go here to, uh, let's see. Uh, what am I looking for? So the uh, the general plan um, committee did meet. And uh, uh, like I said, this was a 27 member advisory committee, five members from each district with two selected at large. They have had way more meetings than we ever intended. Uh, th th that whole thing should have been done by now, but they are still going. And I, I believe, and you know, Sheila, you could probably just quickly weigh in. I think they have about five more meetings to go uh, because the general plan is not just about zoning. We're also having them look at uh, parks and open space and safety and noise, I think. So, um, these are the members of the uh, of the GPAC that you see on your screen right now. Um, and this is, you know, a perfect example, this image uh, of, of how we feel right now. You know, we feel like uh, Lucy just keeps pulling the ball away from us. Um, and uh, it is an unfortunate situation to be in. So I'm, I'm going to just kind of skip through this uh, quickly here. But... These are the required general plan elements. Uh, what we're talking about tonight is land use, but uh, housing, conservation, open space, noise, safety, environmental justice, and circulation are typically all part of that. Uh, we have done a separate circulation element in the past, so that is not a part of this one. Um, uh, and this is uh, just gives you a little shot of what our current zoning looks like here. Um, so all the light yellow areas that you see on the screen, those are all R1 zones. Uh, the, uh, the lighter orange, the darker orange, these are R2s, R3s. Um, there's some mixed use uh, down here. Um, greens, of course, are parks and or, uh, or school space. Um, let's see. So the general plan is not zoning, right? But that is something that we have to consider and talk about. Um, it is not uh, development standards or design guidelines or a guarantee for project approvals. Um, these are all things that we're going to be discussing uh, possibly uh, in the coming two years or uh, the council will discuss once the general plan has been voted on by the general public. So just because the council, this is going to be going to uh, the planning commission and or the council, that's not the last step. Ultimately, all the residents will get to vote on whatever is put forward um, and ideally approve it. If they don't approve it, then then we're in a whole nother situation. But going back to this slide here, these are all things that will be needed to uh, that we will need to discuss. Uh, and so what that means is, you know, and something that I've been pushing for is we need to reevaluate our design guidelines and our development standards. You know, when people are maximizing builds on a lot, you know, and they're removing green space, you know, when uh, we're losing permeable surfaces, um, you know, there's there's a lot of people out there who do not like uh, the flat roof houses because they they are technically within the allowable height limit, but they look so much bigger than houses with um with steep roofs. So uh, all parts of the conversation that we will need to have coming down the line here. Uh, let me just see if I can get to um, so this is what our housing element does. Uh, 
just a quick overview there. And then just want to see. So this is um, these are the focus areas that uh, that the general plan committee has been discussing. Uh, and it, it may be challenging to see uh, on the screen there, but most of the areas that they have been focusing on and uh, discussing as it relates to potentially changing the zoning are the ones that are kind of in a, a, a black outline, if you will. Uh, and you see on the left-hand side, uh, the areas are identified as Artesia Boulevard, Aviation Boulevard, the Tech uh, District, Galleria District. PCH North, Central South, and Torrance Boulevard. Um, they are all areas where we are discussing uh, the potential rezoning uh, of these areas. Um, these, uh, these sites here, as you see, are, um, are also being identified as critical um, sites. Uh, that could allow more housing, um, but you can also see uh, that the areas colored blue eliminates the mixed use uh, designations uh, that that have been previously discussed. So, when we talk about the um, recommended land use plan, um, our total residential uh, right now in the city is. 34,508 units. Um, and now that is uh, supposed to increase. Um, the difference uh, that that is from uh, the current general plan is 2,004 units. Okay, so the higher arena number has now uh, created us to try to find where are we going to put 2,004 units. So uh, this is the timeline that remains. Uh, for for the process that we are going through right now, as you can see, 2017-2018 uh, was uh, was kind of setting the framework, and and the GPAC uh, going through the majority of their meetings. We are now in the 2019 to 2021 process, and so uh, we are now going to be putting together our uh, draft housing element, which we need to send to Sacramento uh, in June. Uh, and then we will be needing to finalize that by October. And then, of course, the general plan uh, committee will be still working on their draft plan, which will then uh, ideally be coming to the planning commission uh, probably in the fall. Uh, 2021 to 2022 is going to be the adoption and implementation. Uh, and that's where it eventually is going to uh, have to come to the uh, general public as a ballot measure. Uh, for a vote. Um, the five remaining meetings I alluded to uh, that the general plan committee will, uh, advisory committee will have is uh, just going to be their policy reviews for land use, open space, safety, and then a review of uh, the consolidated plans. All of those uh, put into one document, which will then be uh, forwarded to uh, the, the planning commission and ultimately the council. So it looks like they're planning on having uh, the remainder of those meetings in the summer and the fall. Um, and then as I mentioned tonight, uh, it's it just started, but it will be going, I'm sure, for a long time tonight is the planning commission meeting. So, uh, and this is uh, specifically related to uh, the zoning that I've been referring to. And then uh, April 20th, next Tuesday, is going to be the first time that the council will discuss this. Um, and then we will be discussing it at our subsequent meetings up until potentially May 18th. Um, so I'm going to just stop sharing my screen right now. And we will go back over to here to see if there are any questions uh, and comments that anybody wants to make before we... Um, before we move on to our final topic. So if anybody has a comment or a question, please feel free to raise your hand. Yes, Lee, go ahead. Yeah, so just so I understand, if I understand correctly, we could run into a, a weird situation where the planning commission comes up with a new zoning plan, it goes to the voters, the voters turn it down, and now we're out of compliance with the state requirements. 
That is that is correct. Yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, Councilwoman MD was bringing that up at our last meeting when we were discussing this. Um, yeah, it could get it could get wonky. Um, what we need to have a better understanding of, and I think she requested that the city attorney come back with that, is like what happens in that situation? Does the state just say, well, the council has, uh, you know, the council has already approved a housing element, and so we're just going to go by that? I, I don't know. And so we're going to need to really understand what are the implications in that type of a situation. It would be unfortunate to go through what is now turning into a four to five year process for the general plan and, and not have it be uh, adopted. Uh, but uh, again, you know, we've seen crazier things happen. So I yeah, know you were just answering all some of follow-up questions. What happens then? Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, Kelly, go ahead. Um, Skag wants to do the pay-to-play uh, with more housing in our area. If you look at the Torrance population compared to the Redondo Beach population per square footage. Um, and you do the math, the population of Torrance is 145, 492, yeah. with an area of 20.53 square miles. Mm -hmm. Redondo's population 67, 423, with an area of 6.21 square miles, 2019 per population stats. Uh, for Redondo, that would be 10,857 people per square mile. Mm -hmm. For Torrance, that would be 7,086 per square mile. Now, this is consideration of the whole square uh, 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 area of Torrance, including the massive refinery. We have a small refinery. Yeah. They have a massive refinery. So if you take that in consideration, it's closer probably to six to 7,000 people per square mile in Torrance compared to 10,000 of Redondo. That's outrageous. Torrance could absorb that. If you go down to 190th, where Toyota used to be, they're bulldozing all those buildings on the other side. God knows what they're going to do. We're not Torrance. You may know. I don't know. Build it there. After Toyota left to Texas because California taxes are too high, build it there. The freeway is there. We don't have a freeway. We need our city council, our city attorney, and everybody else in the city to tell California, no. We don't have the space with 10,000 people per square mile compared to Torrance, which has got less than seven. No, let Torrance, let the other cities that have got wide areas absorb where these people are going to go. They want just more tax revenue. We're not collecting the tax revenue. It's just going to be miserable for us. Let them go over there. The numbers are online. Redondo needs to tell them, no, no pay to play for us. We're not playing the game. Yeah, well, you know, uh, you're preaching to the choir here, Kelly, because we, we have been. I mean, when uh, Councilwoman MD and I have gone to these uh, RENA uh, hearings and stuff like that, that's exactly, and that and our, our staff reports have pretty much communicated this, you know, in graphs showing the inequitable distribution between uh, Redondo Beach and El Segundo or, or Redondo Beach and Torrance. You're absolutely right. You know, they, they are a much larger city. They have a higher propensity of, of R1 areas. Like Redondo, what, what we really believe is that Redondo did what it was supposed to do, you know, in many ways. It, it zoned appropriately. It did, you know, over the past five cycles and we're, we're getting penalized. Um, but we're getting penalized in a way that um, whether the other cities are getting penalized or not, I, I don't believe we should be. I feel like we've done our fair share. And uh, and so it is frustrating and, and we are pushing back and we, we are fighting to the best of our abilities. But uh, at the end of the day, um, you know, there is only so much we can do. And, you know, we uh, we have taken on the state, you know, in, in some cases and we have succeeded. Uh, well, it, it remains to be seen what will happen in, in this scenario. Um, I, I think, you know, at a certain point, you know, a... Uh, um, a, a state uh, is putting putting a uh, a measure on the ballot, you know, maybe the only way to get the state to change their mind, because right now and we've had 
in-depth conversations with Assemblymember Murasuchi, who has been extremely supportive of local control, and, and Senator Ben Allen, who has been supportive, but he's also been trying to be very solution-oriented. Um, you know, right now, the, the vast majority of, of people in Sacramento uh, are, are just want to keep chain, you know, moving the goalposts or, or like that, that, that little picture of Lucy and Charlie Brown showed, you know, just keep pulling the football away from us. Um, just this past year, in 2020, um, there were three new laws related to ADUs that went into effect. That's an accessory dwelling unit, okay? Um, and that's not a bad thing to have an ADU or, or allow uh, people to have an ADU. But um, we had already had uh, created our own local uh, laws and limits as it related to, uh, to ADUs. And then the state had three laws that basically, it basically erased uh, all the limits and, and the decisions we had made as a council. And so now we, and then we have to figure out how to comply and, and one of the things that I find extremely frustrating about this process here with RENA is that these laws just went into effect. The state is trying to put more laws on top, uh, you know, that, that'll change um, zoning and what's allowable on top of us. But they haven't even stopped to consider, well, what does the, those three ADU laws do? You know, what, what does that look like for communities? You know, you've got to give time for communities to adjust to changes and see, well, what, is, what kind of impact is that going to have? Uh, and they're not even giving us a moment to breathe. So it's extremely frustrating, uh, but we're going to keep doing uh, what we can. Uh, qu quickly, uh, and then we're gonna, uh, I'm going to move on to our next presenters. Uh, yes, go ahead. Okay. So once again, with Torrance of the Square, miles of 20.53 and redondo with the square miles of 6.21 redondo is requiring to get over almost 2500 more units how many more units is torrents required to have do you happen to have that number i'm going to tell you uh i don't have the exact number but it's not much higher than what ours is and That's that and, and that that is no, ridiculous no. <laughs> That yeah. Ridiculous. Don't don't yell at me. I didn't, you know, I I didn't make up the number. And and to be honest with you, that was that was also one of our arguments with the last cycle. You know, uh Torrance's number in the last cycle was not that much higher than ours. And so we we have been using that argument to try to uh to get some love from the people that are making the decisions and so far we have been uh unsuccessful. So, uh before I move on to uh, our next topic, any other quick comments? I want to, at 7.15, I want to switch over to the last topic. Christian, this is Joanna. Farmer. Hey, Joanna. Hi. Hi, how are you? Good. Um, actually, I wanted to say I concur with Kelly um, in regards to the amount of density that we already have in the city. It seems crazy, and it also seems crazy that, you know, like when I drive through Salt and Sea and some of the other cities, there mm -hmm. is nothing but vacant land everywhere. Yeah. And I don't understand why they're not building out there when it's just vacant land, nothing but vacant land everywhere out there. Yeah. So has the state addressed that at all? I mean, it, it just seems like you're putting more density in areas where it's already dense. It makes absolutely no sense. And I think, if anything, we should learn something from this pandemic and that that's the last thing we want is density. No, and, and you know, you bring up, well, you bring up a couple of good points, right? Especially coming out of this pandemic, you know, I think you've seen a lot of people move out to where there is more space, you know, or want more space, right? There, everybody's been home, especially in dense areas, and they, they want to have a little bit more freedom. Um, this argument that you're talking about, especially like out in the Inland Empire and, and elsewhere where there is a lot of land, uh, a, a large majority of the cities that were appealing these numbers were, were kind of using that argument. Why not put it out there? Um, and in many uh, I, many of the things I have heard, right, are that well, there's there's nothing out there. You can put the housing out there, but there is no uh, major business or or support network, you know, right now existing in in those areas. And that okay, that that's well and good, but um, but that doesn't mean that 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 can't happen. You know, um, one of the reasons I think that they are focusing on areas, especially here in the L.A. basin uh, that are already dense, is uh, they're using uh, they're, they're calling them high quality transit areas. Uh, and so, you know, the idea being that if people are near high quality transit, they don't need to use cars. And, you know, especially people uh, that are in the very low and the low income areas. 
uh, or, or categories economically, uh, you know, they end up giving you, um, they end up unfairly penalizing you for being in a high quality transit area. And so therefore we end up getting higher numbers and certain places will get higher numbers, but they don't, and one of the, these are, this is another argument that we put forward. What they're not taking into account is, is it to Culver City or the West Side or downtown or, or even to El Segundo in the, you know, where, where a lot of the, the aerospace activity is. Um, and, uh, so I'll use El Segundo as an example, right? El Segundo does not allow housing on uh, the east side of PCH. That's just how they're zoned. But that's where their high quality transit is. That's where all the jobs are. And, uh, and so they are not getting, uh, they're not getting allocated the housing numbers that they should, which would make sense to be put in an area like that because that area does not allow for, for housing. Um, and so other cities like us that are not a job center uh, tend to get penalized. So I, you know, I would agree a lot of these rules seem to be extremely arbitrary. Uh, they don't make sense. That's why we have been pushing back uh, and our staff has only gotten better and better with uh, their arguments. But the, uh, the last hearing that I attended with Councilwoman MD, um, the panel was um, sympathetic uh, and the, the panel is made up of elected officials from a variety of cities all around the Skag area. They were sympathetic to our uh, our arguments and our cause, but they ultimately still did not um, did not allow for our appeal to to go forward. Um, and so it, it is frustrating, and we will just continue to uh, to do what we can to either avoid it or change it or or change state laws. But uh, yeah. So it is now 716, and, and uh, like I said, th this is a lot to pack into one meeting. The one thing I want you all to take away from this is that uh, you it would be wonderful if you participated uh, and you shared your voice with the city council um, as it relates to what I would call equitable distribution of this, uh, of this arena number throughout the city. Um, if I... I, I Redondo, uh, North Redondo residents, uh, you know, sometimes are a bit more quiet, uh, and, and we could really use to, to hear from you. So I know Councilwoman MD has been doing her best to get the information out. Uh, and, and that's, that's really what I'm trying to do right now. So in the next month or tonight, if you want to jump off this meeting, go to planning commission meeting, you know, please feel free to, and, uh, and share your thoughts on this. Um, so I'm going to move on to the last topic for tonight. Uh, and I think we have, uh, let me see. Uh, all right, Josh, I see you there. Great. Um, so we have, uh, uh, Josh Melendez here. Um, right now, um, we are about to, uh, uh, do a couple of green street projects here in the golden Hills. Uh, people, you know, are, may wonder what green streets is. Um, it, it's, as I mentioned, and it's kind of ironic that we're talking about zoning and density and, and the lack of permeable services, but, um, the fact that a lot of homes are built out to the property lines, uh, you know, and we have lost permeable surfaces and lawns and stuff like that, we end up having a lot more runoff, uh, especially when there are, uh, storms and, uh, and you know, rain in general, but, um, and our system, you know, our, our water system right now, stormwater system, uh, can sometimes uh, become uh, overfilled, if you will. Some of the, the piping is, is old and smaller, and, but, uh, you know, at the end of the day, <laughs> wherever the, the water is running off in our neighborhoods, right, uh, it's, it's, it's ultimately going to one space, right? It's going to end up going to a very large stormwater pipe that runs out uh, along uh, 190th Anita and goes down uh, to Hirondo and, and out into the ocean. Um, so what we uh, are trying to do, and it's not just Redondo Beach, it's, uh, it's cities everywhere, is we try to capture as much stormwater runoff as possible. Uh, we try to do this in a variety of ways, uh, and we have multiple projects going on. What we're trying to do here is talk about uh, some projects where we are able to capture and or divert. Uh, and Josh, feel free to jump in if I'm saying something wrong, but capture or divert uh, 
uh, stormwater runoff and have it uh, infiltrate into a, a dedicated area. Um, in some cases, that may be like a bioswale or a, a you know um, an area that is already um, like a a triangle or you know. Uh, or a median along a street. In some cases, it may actually be uh, within the street, you know, creating a, a scenario where the street is porous uh, and water can actually uh, soak in and drain into um, uh, piping and or collection areas that we have created there. So uh, Josh, why don't you take the last, uh, you know, uh, 10, 15 minutes here just to kind of explain what you're doing and where you're gonna be over the coming days so that if people wanna uh, learn more they can. Absolutely, thank you again, Council Member Horvath for giving us the time to, to be able to present the Beach City's Green Streets Project. I'm gonna be sharing my screen for the presentation or if you can uh, give uh, me some access to be able to present and uh, we have a PowerPoint presentation available. Okay, you can share your screen now. Sir. Sorry. So thank you everybody for uh, giving us your time um, and, and uh, time and effort to be able to present the Beach City's Green Street project for Redondo Beach. Um, my name is Josh Melendez. I work with New York Power Communications um, which is a strategic communications and public relations firm right here from Redondo Beach. And I'm also accompanied by Vic Batna, who is the project manager from CWD, which is a civil engineering and water resources and environmental engineering firm who is the lead on this project. Um, you know, pretty much going off of what Council Member Horvath was talking about, green streets are management systems that addresses dry weather runoff for days like today and storm water runoff during rain events. The goal of a green street is to capture runoff, to reduce localized flooding, and to filter stormwater of its pollutants and contaminants that it may carry during a rain event. Traditional streets direct stormwater runoff to storm drain systems that discharge into the ocean. For Redondo Beach specifically, there are several BMPs, or what we call best management practices, that are being considered to capture stormwater runoff. Uh, these BMPs would be installed in two general locations of Redondo Beach. Um, and I'm going to hand this off to my colleague, Nick Batna from CWD, who will be able to talk more about these uh, locations. Thank you. So we are, um, as a group of beach, city, beach cities, um, the, some of the areas that were identified in each of the four cities, and specifically in Redondo, uh, the area that is between Goodman to Flagler, and all the way from Clark, uh, down to Belmont is the general area of what, one approximate area that we're looking to implement different BMPs. And what you're seeing on your screen are different drywalls, grades, uh, pervious concrete, are some of the BMPs that you're seeing. And those are just potential sites in a very preliminary discussion and level. We actually are looking for input and Josh and his team is working to get that input from all of the residents within these areas to actually see where the potential benefits might be or potential concerns from the residents would be. Um, the next area that we're generally trying to target, it is approximately Locksman, Goodman, and the Anita Street at locations. And that's where we're proposing at the triangular parcel that is on Locksman, Ripley, and Goodman, uh, that area is a pretty good area for taking water and runoff from the streets and infiltrating that. Uh, the other area we're looking at is approximately on Anita Street, just um, east of Goodman. And so the total area that we're planning to manage under these two is, um, Josh, next slide, please, is approximately 60 acres, a little over 60 acres approximately. But um, as you can see, these different areas, we've identified and broken them into what is called a sub-drainage. Um, it is, as the, as the storm drains take that runoff, we wanna capture that runoff before it goes and gets into the storm drains because that's the first pollution that is, gets taken out to the ocean, which is the first image that you saw 
um, the trash and everything else at the beaches. So what is dedicated or dis dictated by the Regional Water Quality Control Board uh, to the state board and then to the EPA is to reduce that pollution that gets out to the ocean. So the 85th percentile event, which is a technical number for saying approximately in this area, it's about an inch of rainfall in about 24 hours. So that's the amount of runoff they're planning to capture off of these given areas. Um, on a normal event, if it was an 85th percentile event on a given day, we would have approximately a little just under 90,000 cubic feet of water, which is, if we're talking about in gallons, about 650,000 gallons um, in a given event. Um, and if you think about it, we have 14 inches of rain, so 14 times generally that number. So it's a pretty large number that we're trying to not have it to go directly to the ocean, retain that, infiltrate that water into the groundwater basin itself and treat the pollutants off of what runs off. Um, next slide, please. So I believe some of you might have had seen this. This is from your city. Um, potentially you've seen some of these applications. This is a porous pavement. So this is one of the methodologies you can use as water runs off along the gutter. It actually infiltrates into the ground. Um, you would normally see regular concrete gutter, and this is what is, is called a porous pavement, which is porous concrete, lets the water through it and goes down into the groundwater. Uh, the other here is, um, is it, this is a dry well. So on the image that is on the top is basically where the water comes into it. It's like a catch basin, if you will, or a, or a grate that you will see, which collects that water. It basically treats the water, infiltrates it again. And there's another manhole that you see on the right of the first image. Uh, Josh, I don't know if you can point to it. It's like, yeah, right there. And that's basically the other part of the dry well, which actually infiltrates the rest of the water. So there's different methodologies that come, um, different technologies that can be used. A single dry well, which you see the image that's on the bottom left, or a two system dry well, which is the image that you see on the top. But really on the surface, all you will see is basically a manhole and a grate. Um, this would be a bioretention system and we're potentially planning to use this more along the Ripley Avenue location and on Anita Street side. But this is a, a, a rain garden is basically a lot of, a depressed area where vegetation is grown. It actually treats and helps infiltrate the water, uh, uploads, uptakes, the, the plants actually uptake the pollutants that are out in the runoff, cre creating it, cleaning it, and then it lets those to infiltrate. The other one is that we're planning to plant uh, trees as many as we can, to which also reduces greenhouse gases and reduces the amount of heat that gets created off of the given area. So we will be looking for planting, looking for opportunities to plant trees within the community as part of this project. And I think that was all I had. Yeah, and then going off of what Vic was saying, you know, we would love to hear back from everybody um, in this meeting as well as if uh, you could also help us spread the word. We'll be out there um, providing fact sheets as well as continuing our efforts to reach out to the community. Um, but along with just the trees and any of the other BMPs that we had discussed about that, the city of Redondo Beach wants to hear your, your feedback and get your engagement regarding this process. Um, it would be greatly appreciated. Um, if you have any questions after this presentation or after this meeting, you definitely reach out to us at our email, which is info at beachcitiesgreenstreets.com. I would definitely appreciate in the subject headline if you could just let me know um, which, if you're you know, from Redondo or, or maybe a street uh, that you're from, you don't have to give me your full address at the, at the very beginning. Um, also, if you uh, love to give us a call, uh, our hotline number is 424-271-5072. I'm curious to know. 
Sorry, sorry. No, I was going to say, do you have, um, do you have a, can you provide everybody with where you're going to be? Because uh, I know you're going to be out um, and about uh, so that they know. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this Thursday upcoming, it, we're going to be at a, we're having a pop-up table. What it basically is, is we're going to be at a, a parkhead nearby. Uh, let me confirm what the parkhead is. But uh, last week or this week, actually, we were at Sneary Parkhead. Basically, what we do is we host a table. We invite all community members as you're walking your dogs, taking your normal walk around the block to stop by, say hello to us. We have waters and snacks. We'd love to answer your questions in real time or at least provide more information regarding this project and any other you know, feedback you may have regarding it. For this, uh, for this, uh, sorry, for this uh, upcoming Thursday, we're going to have a pop-up from 4 to 6, and it will be at the... It will be at the Huntington Parkette, um, which is on Huntington Lane in between Harkness Lane and Flag Lane. Um, and we'll be there from four to six. Again, if you're not able to make it, we would love it if uh, you if you can reach out to us either by email or phone. Um, again, our, our purpose here is to try to engage and get, gain your support or at least hear from you so that we can uh, help design uh, the best projects possible for you to serve. Okay. Um, great. And then, uh, Geraldine, I, I know you're on the line, but do you want to say anything or, uh, you don't have to, if you don't want to. No, I just want to say thank you both, um, Vic and Josh for your presentation. Um, I thought your exhibits were great. And, um, like I said, if anyone has any questions or any concerns, please reach out, use that, that email or the phone number provided there. And, um, we will definitely love to hear from everybody, take your input and fine tune our project here so that the community is happy. Thank you so much, uh, council member Horvath. Oh, absolutely. Thank you, Geraldine. Geraldine's one of our, uh, our city staff and engineers and she's working on this project. So, uh, all right. So, uh, it's seven we We're, we're just a little bit over any, uh, any last minute questions or comments before we close out this meeting. I did put all those documents into the chat, so feel free to download those, uh, if you want. And, and then, uh, as I said, they are on the city website. Ron, go ahead. So is this, uh, Permeable Street, the one that you're proposing to have on our block uh, of houses, and if so, when are they starting? No, uh, this this is not your block. Your your block actually needs a, a full reconstruction uh, to to get rid of the ponding that's on that uh, that section of Belmont. So no, this is uh, the the one section of Belmont they showed, I believe, is uh, is around the 1800 block of Belmont, and it's. It's just co uh, permeable concrete, I believe, along the, the edge. Um, but, but no, yeah, yours is going to be part of what, what we will need to do for your street as part of the, the, um, the street rehabilitation program. Um, and, and when we get to that, Ron, too, uh, it may it very well, you know, Geraldine and her team uh, and Andy Wingy, they may look at that and, and say that they want to actually uh, not only reconstruct the street, but, but put in Green Street elements as a part of that process. So, uh, so that, that is yet to be determined, but, you know, something that is already, uh, you know, that we have already started to discuss. Because they did mark and they did cut already. That's why I was wondering. Okay, they may have. Uh, I I I did uh, have them uh, look into coming out to fix that one area of the uh, the pavement that you said was uh, was sinkhole. Yeah, <laughs> not, not a traditional sinkhole, but yes, the uh, the depression. So uh, yeah, anybody else? All right, great. Well, thanks everyone uh, for uh, for coming and spending your time. As I said, uh, planning commission is going on right now. Uh, hope to see you at some of our uh, council meetings in uh, April and May related to zoning, uh, and or at the uh, the May meeting where we discuss dogs and parks. Please feel free to participate in that as well. Uh, and then, of course, budget season's coming up, and so I don't have a topic for next month, but. Uh, uh, but it may be related to uh, budget like we typically do once a year. So uh, otherwise, stay safe, wow. and uh, we will see you all soon, uh, if not Thank virtually. Thank you, Christian, for your time. Uh, absolutely, Thank you Brian. Very much. All right. Take care, everyone.